start again. Hi, my name is Karen Fife. I'm the director of the Metro New York and Southern Connecticut HERC. And I'm joined today by um, my colleague, Mary Jo Serafini in the upstate New York HERC. And we are happy to present John Robinson, the CEO of Our Ability, um, to do a presentation today on um, artificial intelligence as a game changer for job seekers with disabilities. Um, John, I am excited to have you here and, um, and use this uh, uh, opportunity for you to share the work that you're doing both through your organization, Our Ability, and some of your insights into where we are with artificial intelligence, but also um, uh, you know, through the pandemic, how we are um, making strides or not um, in, uh, in inclusiveness for job seekers with disability. Great, thank you, Karen. Uh, so a uh, couple, couple items before I begin. One, this is your time. So, you, you know, I want you all to feel like you're getting something out of this. So please ask me questions. Honestly, the more informative um, I can be, the better off that we'll have, better off, you know, that we'll spend our time you can ask me anything on disability, ADA. Uh, I know that you, you listened to Judy before. Um, you might've heard me before. I don't wanna be repetitive, but I will go into some of it that can be similar. So please ask me questions. So I'm looking at the chat right now. Um, I also realize that we're human nature. We're, listen, we're paying bills. You know, we're searching the internet. We're looking at Pinterest. We're uh, doing, uh, you know, fantasy football or whatever it is. So I realize you're doing something else at the same time. I'm asking you to stop for a minute and, and listen to what I have to say. Put something in the chat so I know that you're paying attention. Um, even if it's the school that you're at, I would appreciate that. Anything so I see some interactivity that, that will make it so much easier for me. Um, just, I've spoken for 12 years as a public speaker. I'm used to uh, being on stage and looking at people's eyes or walking around a room, looking at people's eyes. This is, this is different for me as well as different for the audience. So I understand that. So uh, immediately Jamie gets, uh, gets kudos for being the first one in. And I knew Lori was at Cornell, so that's cool. Uh, so Lori, it's good, good to see you. So I, I've got Jamie and Lori that are paying attention. So the rest of you are asleep and that's fine. Um, I want to talk to you about what we're doing. Hello, Kelly. I wanna to talk to you about what we're doing and I wanna answer questions that you have. And before I do that, I sort of have to, to give you a little bit of background on why I'm doing what I'm doing. And, um, and that is that, as you know, from today, the American with Disabilities Act is 30 years old. And it's a wonderful thing for our community, for our society, for people with disabilities, no matter what the disability is, to, to have this legislation behind us and that we've been working for the past 30 years under the ADA. And if you think about it, more than half of the working population that are 18 to 64 have worked their whole career under the ADA. So it's wonderful that that's been going on. Um, but there's a, a period of time where that wasn't the case. And so individuals with disabilities have been really fighting for uh, opportunity and the way that's the way I'll put it and that's where the ADA came out of. Um, my personal experience is, is very similar. I'm a quadruple amputee, uh, born without the extension of my arms and my legs, born in Binghamton, New York in 1968. Um, grew up in two small towns, one in, in New York, one in New Hampshire. And the time that I grew up in New Hampshire, I, I went to a very small high school and I went to that small high school and fell in love with sports, but not having the adaptive sport programs that we have now, not having the opportunity that we have now. I grew up watching sports. Um, and the way that I fell in love and realized a path for me to, to in my life was to be involved with sports, but not being able to participate was in broadcast journalism, was getting involved and spending a lot of time as a kid listening to TV, watching TV, listening to radio, um, and I realized that that was a possible path for me, that I could connect with sports and I could use that interest and in, in find a career path in the, in the television world. 
So I went to Syracuse University from 1986 to 1990 to study, study television, radio, film. Now that 1990 comes up again because that's the year that the ADA was, was enacted. Um, I went to Syracuse University, had a great four years, uh, met some wonderful people, best friends of my life. We, there were eight guys living in a house that we'd all met each other freshman year. So we all knew each other for all four years. Four of the eight of us were in the Newhouse School in, in, in uh, communication school. And um, that was pretty unique because we were, you know, half of us were really engaged in what was going on in the communications industry and, and half sort of lived it through our, our experiences. Uh, Jim got a job, one of my roommates, Jim got a job immediately with a newspaper in Northern New Jersey and now is an assistant district attorney in Michigan. Um, Dave got a job immediately with the golf industry, with Golf Magazine, and has worked for the better part of the past 20, 20 30 years, I guess, in the, uh, the golf industry and now is, has his own golf consultancy after having left the Golf Channel for the last 12 years. So Dave got a job right away. Pat got a job immediately. Another one of my roommates that went to Newhouse uh, got a job. He worked immediately with the National Basketball Association where he had his internship while he, while he was in college and now runs National Football League films. And then there was me. I had a great GPA, had a great experience at Syracuse, loved going to Newhouse, wonderful internship at a TV station in Boston for the summer between my junior and senior year. Uh, loved that internship and um, enjoyed that a great deal. Um, graduated in May of 1990, uh, as my peers did, and unfortunately heard the same word for four and a half years. And that word was no. I interviewed at TV stations from Boston to Chicago, Montreal to Washington, DC. And in essence, because mostly because the world wasn't ready for a quadruple amputee, three foot nine, to walk into a television station. Um, I wasn't invited to, to work. Um, some of that's on me. Some of that's, you know, uh, having heard the word no all that time, getting frustrated. But most of it is on what, what's gone on. Um, I ultimately did get a job. I got a job in December of 1994, four and a half years after I graduated. And I got that job at, ironically, at a TV station right back in Syracuse, New York. And I had a good 16 year career in television. But I will tell you that. Um, as I went through my career in the, in the television industry, I would get asked sort of two things at the same time. One, come speak to my organization. Uh, repeatedly, I get asked to come publicly speak about overcoming obstacles, the obstacles perceived having limited arms and legs. Um, and I didn't understand why I was doing it, but you know, fine, enjoyed the, enjoyed the experience and the free coffee mugs that I'd get and, and um, you know, everything that entailed with speaking. Um, and I would also hear something from other people with disabilities in the room, the very few other people with disabilities in the room 10 years ago that would present themselves. When I said it was a struggle finding a job, they would nod their head yes. And then privately would talk to me about the struggle. And so I realized that there's a bigger opportunity at play. And so, I, I left the television world, went home one day, said to my wife, I'm leaving my high price job. And um, she didn't think I was uh, wrong, which was great. And I left that high price job in the television industry to start my own organization. And the company is called Our Ability. And what I knew I wanted to do was not to be another disability service provider. But what I wanted to do was to create the business case uh, for businesses to employ individuals with disabilities. See, I knew that I was more loyal, that I stayed at my positions longer than my peers did. And so I knew intellectually that there was some value in hiring a person with a disability because there would be that loyalty factor. I also knew that I ended up being a better employee on average because I wanted the job. I watched hundreds of people come through multiple sales positions and just not succeed because they didn't want to be there. And so I knew that there was this, this opportunity. I started our ability 10 years ago as a solution, as a bridge, a bridge to employment for individuals with disabilities. Um, and I'm, I'm glad I did it because it's a bridge that's been needed. And so what I did 10 years ago was create a website where I knew that 
we couldn't have a brick and mortar building. I knew that we couldn't be everywhere at once, but uh, with the internet, we could put something up and have a place where individuals with disabilities could find us and businesses could find us. And so very quickly after doing that in uh, 10 years ago, I got invited out to Silicon Valley to, to LinkedIn. And I went out to LinkedIn and I, I shared with them my history and I gave a, a talk. And then at the same time, I asked them, it'd be great, it'd be, wouldn't it be great if you could put a button on my LinkedIn profile that would allow me to self-disclose. Now, nine years ago, they didn't want any part of that. They had no interest in doing that. They weren't owned by Microsoft yet. They, they didn't want to go down that path. And, but they said if we built it, that they would be somewhat supportive. So we spent too much money eight or nine years ago to build a portal on our website called Connect. And I'm gonna show it to you in a minute, but I wanna give you the broad strokes. And Connect is a bridge between individuals with disabilities <clears throat> and the businesses that wanna reach. And so that went up and we were happy that we started to get people emailing us, asking us to get involved. And then at the same time, the business community that wanted to search the database and find candidates asked if they could post jobs. And so <clears throat> we, we quickly, not wanting to do this, created a jobs board. And so the jobs board goes up alongside the, the Connect portal and the companies that we work with have jobs posted. And so this is the background for where we are. This conversation's about AI and what we're doing, but I can't tell our story unless I tell that story. Because <clears throat> we are here because I was unemployed for four and a half years. We are here because we have a web presence that allows individuals with disabilities, their caregivers, their parents to be able to um, uh, connect. We are here because there's a business world out there that wants to connect people with disabilities for their future, future enrollment or for future employment. And that's so very important. Uh, 30 years after the ADA is enacted, you know, we're in a more inclusive world, thank goodness. Um, and we appreciate that but we need to remember and include people with disabilities in that, in that realm. And so here we are, uh, we're, we're in the space and we're swimming along just fine. We're, you know, we've got businesses reaching out to us, businesses that post jobs, businesses that search candidates. I've got individuals with disabilities that build a profile in our system and everything's going along fine. And now here we come to the topic at hand, which is artificial intelligence. Um, I knew that I had a certain number of individuals with disabilities that were coming to our website and stopping. They weren't engaging. And if you think about it intellectually for a minute, um, individuals with disabilities have traditionally <clears throat> gone to the internet as a way to solve a problem. Um, the internet ends up being uh, one of the most level playing fields for individuals with disabilities anywhere. Certainly more than going out in public, certainly more than uh, networking in person, certainly more than interviewing. You know, the internet is a great equalizer for our community. And during this time of COVID, there's no better example. I mean, we're, we're on Twitter more, we're in meetings more, we're engaged more, we're worried less about clothing not fitting, about transportation not working, about bathrooms you can't use, about discrimination from people staring at you. You know, you're, we're worried a lot less than that. We can get to the task at hand of work. Um, and so, I knew that we were doing, doing good work, serving a purpose, but we we're still missing people on the front end of our website and that we weren't as accessible as we could be. And so I had a conversation in my driveway. My son's best friend's father worked for IBM Watson two years ago, pulled him aside, said, hey, this is what we've got. This is what we're doing. I know that you work with Watson. I don't know what you do, um, but this is my problem. My problem is I'm not engaging enough people and I'm, I'm not really serving as a virtual job coach like I could for our community in general. And light bulb went off um, in, uh, in, on Ke above Kevin's head and he said, yeah, let's, let's talk. We had a long conversation. At the same time, I had a long conversation with the Information Technology School at Syracuse University. And I said, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is where I need help. Syracuse came back to me and said, we'd like to give you some time from our grad students to, to really think about this problem. But would you work with Microsoft instead of IBM? Sure, no problem. 
Matter of fact, no problem at all because we had applied for a Microsoft AI for Good grant and we received it. And so 18 months ago into 12 months ago, we started really breaking everything that we were doing. And we started to think about artificial intelligence as a, as a way to create a virtual career path for individuals with disabilities. And not only to create a virtual career path, but to, to be a virtual job coach. You see, I had a, a, a voc rehab counselor when I was in high school. And that voc rehab counselor allowed me to go get my education, um, helped me figure out how to uh, maneuver through a federal system, figure out how much money they could put towards an out-of-state school from New Hampshire to New York, um, allow me really to go get my education. But I didn't understand that my job coach there helping me get my education was really to help me find a job because he died, he passed away. And so I got, I fell through the cracks. Now, fast forward 30 years, I've worked with enough job coaches to know that a job coach in today's disability environment, whether it's with a disability service provider, whether it's with a developmental disability community or the voc rehab community for people physically disabled or the blind community, a good job coach has 150 to 250 people in the Rolodex that they have to help. So you better be the top one or two of them if you really want help finding a job that you want to work in. And so we wanted to create not only a portal on our website, but a virtual job experience. And we knew that AI could do it. So very first thing that we did, we started working with eight Syracuse University grad students to, to go through four on design, four on implementation. The four on design wasn't the visible design. It was the design of the questions. It was, what do we need to ask? What's the history that you need to ask from a candidate? What's the engagement with a candidate? What's the, what's the experience of the candidate? And what's the skills? What, what are the skills needed to go get a job? We spent 12 months working on this kind of skilling questions and information questions. And then in the, the implementation, we started working with the, the four other students on what are the processes needed in the Microsoft Azure world to be able to make this come together? Been working on this for the better part of 12 months. Then we realized, okay, we've, we've opened up a huge box. We started working with a third party vendor that Microsoft recommends to help us put this template in place. So we started working with them over the past eight months to actually make this happen. We started working with our front end designer to implement it onto our WordPress front end so that we can, we can then uh, bring it to the front page of our website starting here December 1st. Um, then we were asked, okay, we've gone through all these AI processes on what questions to ask, how to, how to process the questions, how to output the answers. This, we've got this thing working. Now, how do we bring it to market? I knew early on that we had about 20,000, this is a big number and I'm surprised we still do, 20,000 unique users touch our website every year. Think about that. No marketing, no public interface, just Twitter and LinkedIn and Google. We have 20,000 unique users that touch our website every year. And yet we, we're missing people with disabilities that come into our system. So I knew that we needed a better interface to, to engage with that virtual job coach. So the idea is to use a different AI engine to create an interactive voice to text, text to voice chatbot. And so this is what we went to Microsoft with and said, we want to create a, a just, oh, there you go. So we wanted to create a, a better experience on the front end. And so we went back through the process with Microsoft and our vendors and, and Syracuse and started thinking about how do we bring people in through this chat bot. And so we've been working uh, a lot with Azure and Microsoft and Blue Granite and others to, to create a chat bot. Microsoft turned back around to us. What we didn't know is that we were the only one, they were one of three in the world that were thinking about doing this to the point that we'd gone through the Microsoft process. Um, come to find out that another vendor um, had overpromised and underdelivered, And so about six months ago, we were told that we were the ones that sort of succeeded. And they reached back out to us and said, Can, do you mind, John, if we make the chat bot open source, use it for employment purposes, use it for disability services, keep that closed, 
but use the chat bot that's accessible, that's interactive, that has people with disabilities in mind, you mind that making that open source. And so we're gonna do that. Uh, that's been wonderful because that's opened doors into other realms. Now that we've gone through this process, we're being, we're being brought into conversations on disability, um, not just employment, but disability around the world. And how can we use AI technology to help people with disabilities? Uh, transportation, healthcare, education, uh, transition services for, for parents or children with disabilities that are younger. We have so many doors open to us because of the process that we've gone through. And we're, we're really, really excited about that and where that's going. And one example of that is, as this was beginning to unfold, we received a phone call from a different person at Microsoft. Um, and he's, he asked me a bunch of questions and I answered them not knowing who he was. And uh, he said, would you talk to this organization? They would like to create uh, voice technology that can go on to uh, Google Home and Amazon Alexa, and we'll take your questions and answers in your bot and make, uh, make it work with, with Alexa. And so simultaneously, while we're creating a website and web portal and using AI to do that, we're also coming out with voice technology. You could be sitting in your living room, listening to your Amazon Alexa and ask it to open jobs ability, and away you go and you start to either build a profile or you find jobs that, that fit your ability. We're really, really excited about that. And this is something that, that um, we've really put a ton of time into, uh, manpower, dollars, and, and hopes and dreams of the people with disabilities that we've talked to every day for 10 years that need to have something, something that they can engage with. What's great about AI, and I'll speak specifically to Microsoft right now, is Microsoft themselves and through their Azure platform are doing everything that they possibly can to make it accessible. And they're thinking about universal design from every angle. And they are absolutely building it with people with disabilities in mind. So as you know, the, the, the schools on this, on this Zoom meeting have future employees with disabilities, have future students with disabilities, if you have personal family members with disabilities, that the AI work that's being done um, through the Azure platform is, is unbelievable. And we're only scratching the surface at our ability on what we can do for people with disabilities and employment. And we're only scratching the surface on what we can do for the businesses to be able to search the database and find great candidates. So we're really, really excited about that. Um, I've learned a lot. I didn't get in this to to be a tech company by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I got in this to create a, a solution to a problem that I had 30 years ago, which is I just wanted to find a job. And it wasn't the job that I wanted to find necessarily. It was the family that the job afforded me. It was the house that the job afforded me. It was the car that I could buy that the job afforded me, right? And what's universal, when you, when you meet people with disabilities, we just wanna live our best life. And employment affords us the opportunity to live our best life. And that's why we do what we do and, and, and you know, why we're excited about what we do. So I'm gonna pause for a second and I'm gonna give you a moment to type in a question if you have one. And what I wanna do in the meantime is I wanna show you our, uh, show you our, my PowerPoint here for a second and run this through with you. If you can all see that, I assume you can see that. This is the front page of our website. Um, and if you've been, been listening to me, you may, maybe you poked around our website for a second. This is our ability.com. This is a, uh, a generation ago on the website, but it's fine. It, it illustrates the story. Again, we are um, you know, not brick and mortar. We're web and, and here we are. The, the original portal, uh, up until November 30th of this year, looks like this, individuals with disabilities, click individual registration, they sign in, they type a whole bunch of information in. And so this was the latest and greatest eight years ago. You type information, you put your location, but you're doing a lot of typing. It's not a resume upload by any stretch of the imagination. You're doing, you're putting a lot of, a lot of effort into building your profile. And then this is the jobs board that still exists today. We're in, in uh, companies that we work with, 
we post jobs, we scrape jobs, they're up and they're, they're ready to go. And this will, will continue um, as we've discussed. And now here, as of December 1st, is our new system. We have on the front page of our website will be a chat box, the top left of the website that will talk with you, that will ask you a question, you answer the question. And once you answer the first question, you come into a closed system and you come into the closed system. And as you answer Abby's question, Abby being the first three letters of ability, ABI, as you answer Abby's questions, um, you are in essence building your profile. So instead of typing in information now, you're putting in your work history, your ideal job, um, your education, and any capabilities. We spent hundreds of hours building skill questions, the soft and middle skills needed for the disability community to go to work. Any industry specific questions that we have from industries that have come to us, like out of the blue, the mining industry in Canada came to us, said, could you put a bunch of mining questions in there? Sure, whatever. Um, you wanna pay us to do that, we'd be very happy to do that. So we spent a lot of time in not only building the chatbot technology, but then taking those answers from the chatbot, building a profile for an individual candidate, and then taking the profile that's been built and using artificial intelligence to create that virtual career path, search for those at those jobs in real time, what's there on the jobs board, do an AI artificial intelligence match between my profile and the words that are in a job description, giving me an opportunity to look at jobs on my behalf. And then I can go ahead and save those jobs and save them for future reference or apply to those jobs, depending on where I am in my career journey. And then on the corp company side, companies are able to log in as well, search candidates and save candidates. And so we're, real, we're really excited about what we've built and bringing it to market here in, in a little bit and uh, helping individuals with disabilities and businesses find each other and using, um, uh, using AI to be able to do it. So Paul, Pauline says she's blind and can't see it. Great, um, Pauline, I will describe as much as I can. If you like, we can either do that offline or we can do that here. But in essence, I was describing what our website looks like and the functionality of our website. And you bring up a, a, a something I should mention. We are right now going through the accessibility checker to make sure it's accessible. And we have used uh, four individuals that we know as uh, test subjects for in the blind community that to help us um, make sure that it's accessible through screen readers and screen reader technology. So we're, we're excited about that. Um, I'm gonna pause for a second and see if there are any questions here that um, that pop up. Um, Kelly's asking me, and Kelly, you can you can speak it if you want, or I can read it. But companies are using AI platforms like TrustSphere to to ex assess performance. What are the risks benefit from a disability inclusion standpoint? Um, I don't know anything about TrustSphere, so that's that's fine. Something I can look up. Um, the I mean, the, the risk benefit of, of inclusion and what we're doing and what we're building is, is the whole reason why we're doing everything that we're doing. Um, I understand that individuals with disabilities have the skill to, to go to work. Um, I understand also at the same time, I didn't always present myself well in interviewing for those jobs. But if we could level the playing field and take bias out of it for a second, I certainly deserved a job more than four and a half years after I interviewed. And so the point of this system is to take the intellectual bias out of it, to go through skill questions and skill answers, present them into a profile, do a match for a job, and then the business can see that multiple people have matched to their position and individuals can see that they match to specific jobs. To get this, sort of out of the bias world and into, hey, there is a career path using AI technology and taking my skills and how they present themselves into the workplace. And so we're, we're excited about that. And we know that there is an absolute need just based on our conversations with companies around the world as we've talked about this. Um, you're welcome, Kelly. And I, I'll, uh, 
that's pretty cool about Trustfear. I'll, I'll check them out. Um, how have we measured the success of our abilities website? Again, we're bringing this to market here December 1st. So I'll, I'll give ourselves a pass. We can't measure ourselves until it goes out there. Um, but beside that, um, we know that we have an individual with a disability that emails us or calls us or tweets us every day. Every day, somebody's asking us a question on, on employment. And every week, we have a new company that asks us for help. So we know that by putting this up there, people are using us as a conduit to start connecting with each other. Um, we wanted to build the sandbox. My, my, I believe, I'm a very strong believer in personal responsibility. Personal responsibility is so very important and people with disabilities share the responsibility of finding employment. Um, I, as I said at the very beginning, I did not wanna be a disability service provider, meaning I didn't wanna force somebody to go get a job somewhere. I wanted to provide the tools for me to find a job 30 years ago. Uh, so we're building the sandbox and then it's up to our community and the businesses to speak to each other in that sandbox. And that's, I feel really strongly about that. Um, that the, the, what keeps me up at night more than anything else is the, the need for people with disabilities and parents of people with disabilities to make their dream bigger, right? And to go out and take personal responsibility, to find a job. That's what we're doing. So we're, um, we're building the sandbox. Now, I will tell you, I do know the statistics on our website. I did tell you just a minute ago, we have 20,000 unique users every year. That's a huge number. Um, and we know how many companies search us. And yes, privately, we know how many people have found jobs, but that's not something that we're gonna report because it, again, personal responsibility, because no matter what number I give you, it, you're gonna either have a preconceived notion that's higher or lower than it should be. And I don't wanna do that. What I wanna do is put people together with businesses and help them find each other. Great, and so Meryl asked that question. Galaxy S10, thank me, you're welcome. <laughs> um, and if there's any other questions, please please pop them in here. Um, I guess one thing I should say to you, all of you, and I, I do this in a lot of the talks that I give, um, I do all this because I wanted a job. I wanted the job because I wanted the family. And so yes, uh, you know, as a quadruple amputee, if you see me walking down the street or you see me giving a, a, a major talk, I do have a family. I am married. Um, Andrew and I have been married for, for uh, I think it's about 27 years now, if I could do the math on the fly. And we have three children, and so I'm proud of that. And so our youngest is uh, just doing college applications right now. And so we're really excited to get him out of the house because we've had teenage children in our house forever. Our oldest is 31, our middle is 23, and our youngest is 17. So um, you can do the math on all of that and realize that I have sick of, i'm sick of teenagers and so they need to get out of the house and go off to college so there you go but i do all of what i do because i wanted the lifestyle that everybody else had and employment afforded me the lifestyle yeah so meryl you're, you're asking questions about are we tracking we obviously are tracking how many people are seeing jobs. I know how many people have connected with a specific job and in the new system, I'll be able to report that to the companies. Um, again, getting interviews, it, it's, think about it from this standpoint. Let's say Columbia is on, on this call and I know that Columbia had four people with disabilities that clicked through to apply for the job. I can quietly go to Columbia and say, hey, you know, what happened to these four people. But I don't want to ever report publicly that only one out of four were qualified to, to, or all four out of four, right? I don't want to do that. That's not what this is designed to do. I do want to show Columbia that there are a number of people in the system. And if you want to be inclusive, let's get, let's get you into the system to find each other. But there is absolute, it actually hurts our cause if we start reporting numbers like that. And so that'll never be the case. Um, what we will do is say there are X amount of people in the system, there are X amount of job postings, and we know how many people have looked at each other. And I can go to Columbia and say, hey, do you know that there's 1,500 people that click through to your job? That's a number you should know. 
hi hires and interviews. And that's that's your process, and that's the candidate process. I, that again, I don't want to be involved in that, and I it's really really key for me to 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 bring that up because that's a a, a dangerous place that I don't want to be in. We want to create the sandbox and let you talk with candidates. Karen? Hi. Um, thanks so much, John, for all of your insight and the information about your, um, your really exciting work. I wanted to um, invite anybody to unmute and ask a question specifically to John if they would like to do that versus doing it in the chat. Um, but I do have, um, you know, a couple of uh, questions for you as it relates to technology and um, kind of the, the disparity that we do find in access and how we might um, both as, you know, um, employees within higher education, but also just as, you know, part of the human race, how, how do we go about um, evening that out so that folks will have access to this um, opportunity to use the technology if you're, you know, in your conversations with Microsoft, um, kind of how are we doing that? Because I think the pandemic has really highlighted that disparity, um, you know, when you talk about school kids or um, just people in the workforce. So any thoughts that you have on how your organization is maybe um, looking at that or, um, you know, thinking about that piece of it? Yeah, we're definitely, we're definitely thinking about it because the, the, there needs to be access, right? So, the, I mean, the most important thing is that people have access to a mobile phone or tablet or, or, or computer and have internet access or cell access to be able to, to find us. Um, you know, the, I know that the world is thinking about this, right? I mean, how do we create more universal access? How do we create um, a, a national Wi-Fi system? I think that's really what, where 5G came from is to, is to figure all that out. Um, my, my belief is that we, because of this virus, we are, we are more accessible than ever. And so we're going to continue to build products, services, solutions using technology, which means we're not going to, this isn't going to go away. Um, we're building this on, on the most advanced AI platform there is to date. So that's good for us. Uh, that means that it's not going away anytime soon. Microsoft's not selling to anybody anytime soon. So we're, we're going to be just fine that way. Um, but we are aware that we're at the mercy of people having a phone, tablet, or computer to, to build this. Um, we've, we understand that. But while every, well, I shouldn't say every, most public school systems from kindergarten through transition after high school are using technology to educate uh, that, you know, we're, because of COVID, we've all become more used to this, quite frankly, talking to Zoom, listening to into Zoom. People with disabilities are the same. I've watched my wife, who's a special ed nurse in her classroom on Zoom in the spring with, with students with disabilities, right? So we're, we're more in line than we ever have been. I think COVID in, in, a, in a horrible way, Karen, will help the community of people with disabilities, maybe more than any other community, because we've always been isolated. Uh, we've always been sort of shunned in society, and yet we're used to technology. Great, let's let's be used to technology and getting up and going to work. And so this will help us, maybe more than any other single moment. And we we at our ability are really lucky to have been building this during the time of COVID. We did not build this because of it. We've been working on this well before it, as you know, Karen, and as we've spoken about, um, we, we've, uh, we've been doing that. And so this is good timing for us to be able to bring people's skills to the marketplace using technology faster. And what I know from the companies that we work with, they're asking us, hey, we, we want candidates and, and we may have had jobs that had to be in person before. We are fine with being virtual right now. I mean, we work with two major banks right now that went from their their call center, their collection center, their mortgage, their mortgage writers were all in person 
and now they're all virtual and they're going to stay that way. Well, that opens our world up immensely to that. So, you know, we're excited about that. And then just to follow up on that, John, are there things that um, we within higher education can do um, to create more inclusion in the process? So you talked about um, creating questions and matching skills. What do we need to do on the hiring side or when we're thinking about creating job descriptions that are more inclusive um, or easier for your sort of AI pieces to do those matches? That's a great, great question, Karen. And the truth is one of the exciting things that we're gonna be able to see is what jobs are being clicked. And, and so, which means the career path will be built based on the words that are written in the job descriptions. It, it, the ones that will be successful are the ones that will have the higher numbers. Uh, the ones that don't have the higher numbers, I'll be able to come back to and say, hey, Karen, why, you know, let's think about well, how we're writing this job description. We're gonna be able to reverse engineer the, the writing of the job description, which, will, which we will be able to help that process for the disability community specifically which is really universally designed for everybody. So it's gonna be exciting to realize, okay, these keywords are really important if you wanna grab this community. And so that's, that's gonna be the fun of reverse engineering that with, with all of you to say, hey, the job description needs to be this, you know, shorter in length, longer in length, these words, not these words, um, this salary, not this salary. We're gonna be able to tell you that based on how it matches with the, with the AI. Great, thank you. Are there other questions here? I mean, I could kind of go on all day with John, <laughs> but um, you know, uh, one of the things that we taught or Judy spoke about this morning um, is that really, um, you know, not segmenting just the disability community, but you know, sort of the umbrella of diversity and inclusiveness. And where do you see that with technology and AI? Like, do you see that also as um, you know, a, another Judy, piece or? Uh, God bless Judy. I mean, you know, listen, the truth is I wouldn't be a disability advocate if there weren't the Judys in the world, right? And so that's, that's fantastic. Um, the, you know, but we're not in a perfect place yet, right? So we still have to, we still have to do that. We're building this for the community of people with disabilities, which are encompassing developmental disabilities, physical disabilities, uh, learning disabilities, veterans with disabilities, et cetera. And if you think about that, we're really building this for everybody. Um, you know, a, a lot of the time I've spent 10 years doing, doing the speaking world of our ability, you know, I've advocated that disability be part of the diversity community. You know, and the truth is we, we are because anybody in any diverse category can be disabled tomorrow and become part of our population. Um, and so we, have, we always have it in mind at all times. Um, so the nice thing about building this for our world, whether you're blind, whether you're deaf, whether you're developmentally disabled, you know, whatever it is, we have to think about all of you anyway. And it, it really does pare down to questions. You know, question of an ideal job, question of your skill, question of your ability, and question of your interest. And so we don't, you know, it's, it's done uh, without seeing anybody, without making any preconceived notion, uh, other than zip code. We, I mean, we're, we're looking at zip codes because we need to match zip codes to jobs, and that's it. We're not looking at income. We're not looking at, at skin color. We're not looking at religion. We're not looking at any of that because disability is encompassing of all of that. And so we, we get to shed, shed that a little bit, which is nice. We don't even ask about specific disability either. Um, we've had one partner ask us to do it. We've, we've, we've uh, strongly resisted that because we don't want to know about a person's disability either. We do want to talk about accommodation, but I could have a specific accommodation that's regardless of my disability. So we're, we're taking that out of it as well. Great. Any other questions from the group? Um, 
And then anything else that you want to add, John, as a sort of a closing note, I know um, for those of you who didn't have an opportunity to watch John as part of our panel presentation from this morning, um, we are, you know, all of our sessions have been recorded and are um, available following the conference um, for viewing. So you can hear John uh, speak with some of our other panelists from one of our sessions earlier today, but also just um, any closing thoughts about where do we go from here with the pandemic um, in your mind, um, you know, as you know, as we in higher education, as well as so many other businesses are struggling with, um, you know, the economics um, and the fallout there, and how do we ensure that we continue on this path of um, inclusiveness and not letting that fall by the wayside? Any sort of, you know, inspirational words from you? I know you you, you always have a lot of, of that for us, John. Um, um, in your in your he hearing you speak, but you know things that we can really be thinking about and taking to heart because it's great that we all come to the conference and listen to um, so many experts in their field. But what what can we do personally and professionally to ensure that that message of inclusiveness um, doesn't get lost in kind of the other economics and sort of trauma that is. Um, that we're all experiencing. Yeah, and there's, I think, Karen, one of the things we all have to understand is we are going through a, a, a multi-generational change right now with COVID. Uh, this is, the, the impact that this will have on us is, uh, we can't even fathom what that's going to be. Whether you're, uh, whether you're a major university um, or you're an online school or you're me as an entrepreneur, and a, a you know tech company or or whomever you are, we just don't know uh, where this is all going to take us. I think we all have hopes, but we have no control over this. And and maybe it's a good lesson for all of us that we don't have a lot of control on this roller coaster that we're on. Um, what we can control is a, a couple of things. One, how we how we personally meet each day. And, and how we try to, to deal with it ourselves. Um, person with a disability, parent of three kids, uh, business owner, you know, I get up worrying about my business, thinking about what we're doing, uh, providing a task at hand for the day and, and moving through that day. Um, in the inclusion part of your question, you know, a lot of the people on this Zoom are dealing with employees or potential employees or students or potential students. You know, I think it's just, it's awareness of that you don't know who you run into. 71% uh, of the people with disabilities, their disability is invisible. You don't know who's presenting themselves to you. And through this, um, if I didn't raise my arms, you wouldn't know that I'm a, I'm a quadruple amputee. I could easily have kept my arms down and you, you just wouldn't know, okay? Um, you don't know who's presenting what to you. I, we all have human bias, okay? And so the two pieces of advice around that I would give you is allow yourself your human bias, then take a deep breath and then power through it. You're human, you're allowed to be human. Um, don't beat yourself up, take the deep breath, and then look at the person's ability, whatever it is they're doing, job applicant, student, friend, uh, person at the grocery store, look at the person's ability. If we can do that, we can look past beyond disability, skin color, race, religion. We can do that. And I think one of the things that, that COVID has really done for me is it's made me focus on what I say, not how I say it, maybe more than anything else. I can get on stage, I can make you laugh, I can make you cry, and I can get in my truck and drive away. Um, but if I really want to have an impact, it's what we do. And what we do is way more important than any of that. And so I think the advice that I give at this time is see people for what they do, what they bring to the table, who they are, and realize you just don't know who is who's across the desk um, until you get to know them. 
and with disability specifically, the other part of this, which is true, which I said before, you know, you, you can be part of our community tomorrow. God willing, I hope you're not. Um, but it is possible. The one, we're the one diversity category that anybody can join us at any given time. And we, we all, I think, intellectually understand that. And once we say that out loud and absorb that internally, each of us, disability becomes a little bit more understandable for everybody. And, and so we, you know, it's something that I think about as, as we go forward. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. That was really um, powerful ending for us uh, this afternoon from your talk. Again, I truly appreciate your joining us live today, especially after being a panelist for us um, earlier um, uh, in the month in the pre-recording session. And everyone, I would encourage you, if you didn't have a chance to watch any of our pre-recorded sessions or all of them, to come back onto the platform. This session has been recorded, so if you missed any part of it, um, if you joined us late, please feel free to come back onto the platform in a few days where we will have uploaded um, everything from today. And again, John, I wish you all the best. I look forward to our continued work together. And um, thank you for, um, uh, for everything that you do for um, my, my constituents, my members, and for um, your partnership. Um, thank you again. And I hope you'll join us for other parts of today's um, program. I promise. Thank okay. you. Bye.